Okay, here we are. All right. Um, heavy metals as the way for microbial control. Um, not really easily applicable in the household settings, right? You can spray them on the surfaces. It's kind of hard. However, uh, some of them are used for microbial control. For instance, this is the list of heavy metals that can be used. Not all of them metals, though. So, um, mercury, silver, gold, copper, arsenic, and zinc. Uh, arsenic is not a metal. Okay, and honestly, using arsenic as the microbial control method uh, not the most brilliant idea. Um, it kills the horse together with the microbe. So, we'll just historically, it was used. Uh, these chemicals, these metals, they have a so called oligodynamic anti microbial effects, which means that they act in the trace amounts, really small concentrations. Uh, the mode of action for them, they inhibit enzymes. So they bind to the active side of the enzyme and just, you know, change the structure of the, of the protein molecule. Um, obviously, they can do that not only the, with the enzymes of bacteria, they can do it with humans. So they're toxic. Um, zinc is probably the least toxic. Uh, some, you know, you may have seen uh, the um, ads for the cold medications that contain zinc. The antibacterial effects, it, it was shown that zinc can reduce the length of infections like common cold. Okay. Um, how justified is that? I don't know. I, I didn't see good placebo-controlled clinical studies, but Probably because I didn't really look close enough. So zinc is implicated in the uh, microbial control. Now, um, mercury used to be a common metal for the dental treatments. Amalgam was placed into the, well, Lydia would know terminology better, the hole to kill the nerve, right, before the um, nerve extraction. Yeah, because mercury is pretty toxic. Uh, the same reason mercury is pretty toxic prevents it from wide usage as the antimicrobial uh, treatment. So what we have left is this three, silver, gold, and copper. Are they used? Yes, they are. You can find copper in things like the doorknobs, especially in older buildings, right? Older houses, you often find copper stuff, copper furniture around you, okay? Um, silver, in the silverware, copper is often used for coating the um, insides of things like incubators for bacteria. I don't have any spare change, but coins that we use day-to-day -day basis, uh, especially, surprisingly, the white ones, so dimes, nickels, quarters, they contain a decent amount of copper. Okay, so that, that is antibacterial. Now, some people even suggested that if you drink um, silver, like colloid silver, it's colloidal solution of elementary silver and water, 
and you're going to treat your bacterial infections. All that leads to is the condition known as arguria, accumulation of, it's irreversible accumulation of silver in the body, turns skin grayish, bluish, same goes for sclera. Um, it's not really going to kill you, but it's probably, it's probably going to reduce your lifespan. Okay, so taken overall, Listerine contains a little bit of zinc chloride, although its effectiveness in the um, microbiome of the mouth is debatable because in addition to that, Listerine also contains ethanol often. Okay, so it's another antimicrobial agent. So what we have left is usually silver and copper. Why not gold? Yeah, it's expensive. I mean, you can you can gold plate all the uh, doorknobs in your house if you have money. It's not a problem. You know? Now, copper is, of course, because of the cost, is extensively studied as the potential antimicrobial agent. So before we move on to the discussion of that um, study that I brought up here, I want to mention a few things about copper. Since ancient times, it sounds like really lousy PBS movie, I know, but since ancient times, people knew that copper has antibacterial properties. There are records that ancient Greeks, the soldiers in ancient Greece, they don't ask me how, but they noticed that shavings from the bronze swords that they use, and bronze contains a lot of copper, okay, shavings from the bronze swords, when they were placed in the open wound, they prevented the wound infection, okay, same reason if you would um, go into, I don't know, Cleveland Museum of Art and go into the um, rooms with like ancient artifacts, a lot of cooking ware is green. Green is copper, okay? It's oxidized copper. So they notice that water doesn't go bad in the copper vessels. Food stays fresh longer in the copper vessels. So they used copper. They didn't know why, but they noticed that it prevents essentially bacterial contamination and bacterial growth. So knowing that, um, Dr. Michael Schmidt and colleagues designed a large multi-center study. Several hospitals, mostly, I wouldn't say mostly on the East Coast, several hospitals. So they wanted to see how does copper behave in the clinical settings in terms of the microbial control. For this, for this they selected the objects in a typical hospital room that are contaminated with microbes, including a bezel of the screen. You know, when people touch the screen, they also touch the bezel. Table, bed railings, armchair, ivy pole. Uh, there should be keyboard somewhere, okay? So it kind of gives you, okay? Bed rails, call buttons, computer mice, chairs, tray tables, pretty much data input devices, and palm rest of laptop, computer, IB poles. So what they did, they took those parts and they copper plated them. Turns out it's a pretty expensive procedure, especially for the bed rails, because you have to disassemble the bed, send the rails, they plate them, send back, you assemble it back. But um, they consulted with companies that make the beds, it's going to be much cheaper if copper plating is done during the bed manufacturing. Okay? So then they started to count the number of species and the titers of species in the rails. So this picture B okay, represents the bacterial load on different surfaces in a hospital room before plating. 
Um, bed rails, well, you can read it kind of yourself. Bed rails, computer mice, armchair, uh, tray tables. That's something else. I don't remember what it is. Uh, purple, oh, ivy pole. No, 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 that's uh, the input devices, and that's ivy pole. So it's kind of, I try to follow the sequence. So you can see, and red lines, which I'm going to highlight with blue. So these lines, they represent the acceptable level. Everything is above is considered risky. Everything below is considered okay. You follow? So they count the total number of bacterial cells, and then they got to break down for Staphylococcus, MRSA, gram-negatives, and VRE stands for vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. It's a, quite an important cause of hospital-acquired infections. We're good so far? Cool. Then they compared it to the plated ones. Well, guess what? There's a significant decrease in number of microbes on all those sites. That makes sense? They pretty much got rid of MRSA, various gram negatives like E. coli, Enterobacter, Aerogenes, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and so on and so forth. Hmm? It's pretty effective. So, this idea now is being like pedaled forward. So, hospitals start actually to use copper plated doorknobs. Whatever they can copper plate, they copper plate. And as I mentioned, when you think about this, you may say, ah, who cares? We can treat them with antibiotics. People who get infected with H, A, I, hospital acquired infections. But on the other hand, think about this cost. Each day the person spends in the hospital is additional money. That is a burden for the patient, for the insurance company, and for the hospital. Make sense? For the economy, because person spends extra time in the hospital, the person doesn't work. So, by all means, and think about this, it's a many year investment. You do it once, and it works for years. The great thing about heavy metals, Microbes can hardly develop resistance to them because it's such a fundamental property of those metals to bind chemical property, to bind to proteins. It's virtually impossible to imagine protein consisting of those 21 amino acids that wouldn't bind copper ions. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a fundamental property of life for those metals to be toxic okay and unless humans don't unless humans gnaw on the copper plated bed rails kids do that yeah but adults usually don't um, it's safe unless you like, leak the bed rails all the time while you're in the hospital so just to show you that there are studies ongoing studies how to reduce the, the bacterial contamination in the hospitals. Alkylating agents. So what they do, they add so-called alkyl group like this one, okay, to or this one, two different biological macromolecules, nucleic acids, proteins. <clears throat> Disrupting the structure of either, disrupting the structure of nucleic acid or disrupting the structure of proteins. For instance, they can form linkages between the amino groups of proteins or carbohydrate peptidoglycans, essentially uh, altering the structure of the outer membrane of gram negatives or cell wall of gram positives. What are those alkylating agents? You probably have heard about formaldehyde, and it's, which is gas, and it's water solution, formalin. Formalin is used to preserve bodies. 
okay? Glutaraldehyde is a close relative of the formaldehyde and is also used as the a quite effective antimicrobial treatment. They're all sterilizing. Glutaraldehyde is liquid sterilizant. The problem with both of them is they toxic. Formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde are toxic. Same goes for, sorry, not this, but this group of chemicals. Beta propione lactone and ethylene oxide. You can see that both of them possess this unique oxygen um, in between the carbons, makes them really um, powerful alkylating agents. Ethylene oxide is often used to sterilize plastic goods. Beta propion lactone is liquid, so it's powerful sterilizant that you can apply to the surfaces. Does that make sense? Now, formaldehyde is the gaseous disinfectant, a gas that has a sterilizing capacity. So we watched the movie about BSL-3 and BSL-4. Well, BSL-4 mostly. I told you about BSL-3 experiences. If you bring something in the BSL-3 or BSL-4 suite, piece of equipment, say pipette, can you take it back to the normal environment? No, you cannot take it back to the regular lab. It is immediately considered contaminated. Does that make sense? What if some piece of equipment is broken? How do you fix it? You can kind of sneak in the person in BSL-3, which is still going to be illegal. BSL-4, without proper training, you cannot. So what do you do? Well, imagine it's a piece of equipment that's $25,000 cost, and the part that is broken, maybe, I don't know, maybe the repair is like 1000 bucks. You really don't want to run it through the autoclave, because then it's going to be a piece of junk. Every year, BSL-3 and BSL-4 suites have the decontamination days, decontamination weeks. And decontamina decontamination is done by formaldehyde. The entire suite is pumped with, you know, filled up with formaldehyde through the HVAC system. And it stays there for several days and then HVAC is turned on and it sucks all, all formaldehyde. So it's for two weeks, the suite doesn't work. And then, you know, after formaldehyde is pumped out, people come in and it's miserable experience because formaldehyde is not gone completely. If you ever had a chance to inhale it, you will remember it forever. You have a headache, your respiratory system goes to hell. It's really bad experience. Okay, but you come in and if you need to bring something down, you bring something down, so everything is considered to be sterile at this point. Does that make sense? So it's sterilizing. You can sterilize rooms, plastic, medical devices like last thing to address home goods that what are they sterilizing non sterilizing what not let's see um, tell me if you use that Lysol sanitizing wipes well I have an analog not the brand name quad quaternary ammonia Okay, so it's not, it's detergent, so it's definitely not sterilizing, it's sanitizing, it helps to remove the contaminants from the surface. Same goes for Clorox, the exact, exactly the same compound, okay, so it's not really, in, in, although they claim they disinfect, <clears throat> I wouldn't trust that clay. Okay. Unless you leave the wipe on the surface and let it dry there, it's probably not disinfected. Does that make sense? <coughs> Tylex, it's a halogen. So these guys are disinfectants. Okay. Mildew removers are disinfectants. They're not sanitizing, 
concentration is unlikely to be sufficient to kill endospores. We discussed the antibacterial soaps. The efficiency of them is not any better than the regular soap. Okay. Lysol disinfecting spray, again, quad, mixed with alcohol. When you mix two things together, it usually increases the disinfecting properties. Okay. So you mix ethanol and quaternary ammonia. Together they work better than each of them separately. Does that make sense? I do not wear contacts, so I can't really appreciate. But it makes sense that chlorhexidine is an active compound for the contact lens solution. As far as I can understand, you gotta, you cannot put them in the tap water. Okay. Um, moist towelettes. Again, it's a quaternary ammonia compound. Okay, so not mostly sanitizing. I have no idea what it is. I never ran into noxzema triple clean. So if you know and you use it, you know it's phenolic. So triclosan probably not effective. Scope and Prel ethanol. Okay, so disinfecting. Pine sole mixture of different phenolic compounds and surfactants. So it means that it's going to be disinfecting. Okay. It's quaternary ammonia and phenolics. And allergen eye drops. I never saw one. Never used one. So for me it was a discovery that such thing exists. This is a chloride. So it's very, very, very mildly oxidating. So probably it's Antibacterial? I don't know. I don't really know. Is that the active compound in allergen eye drops? Is that just the, con uh, the 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 preservative that prevents them from going bad? So, but at least now you know what you spray on the kitchen counter. That makes sense. Now, um, before we move on to before we start like historical excurs, uh, historical overview of the antibiotics, I have uploaded the study guide number three. And for the chemicals that we discussed, you have to understand the mode of action, whether they disinfecting or sterilizing, okay? And I also have some specific questions like about triclosan, what was the problem with that? Um, Something else. I, I don't remember, honestly. So, I do not go beyond the study guide. Don't worry. Okay, if you can answer the questions on the study guide, it's in the question form, you should be fine. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk about, we're going to do the historical overview of antibiotics. This is something for you to consider. Until 20th century, people did not have drugs against the bacterial infections. Mortality rates from strep throat among kids now are estimated at that time. So current historical studies estimate that mortality rate strep throat can be as high as 80%. So every four out of five kids who get strep throat die. Not because of the strep throat, because of the generalized streptococcal infection. It's kind of sobering because we didn't have any drugs. The first attempt to create antimicrobial drug was taken by Paul Ehrlich, a German immunologist that created Salversan, arsenic-containing drug targeted specifically against syphilis, 
Treponema pallidum. It was effective. It cured bacterial infection. The side effects of arsenic-based drug, though, were so <laughs> bad, <laughs> um, it was pretty much comparable to syphilis. It was temporary, though. So, lucky people who survived the treatment, they completely recovered. Okay. But, um, technically, well, although debatable, the first purely synthetic antibacterial drug was Prontosil, the first representative of the family uh, of sulfonylamides, sulfa drugs, triple sulfa, that she had its member of the of that family, sulfonylamides, it's, uh, was effective against the compositive uh, streptococci and staphylococci. It was designed I keep forgetting. I look it up and I keep forgetting. It's either Bayer or BASF. I think it was BASF, a uh, German chemical company, where they designed this three German guys, designed the drug. It, it was actually initially a component of the, the precursor for dyes, the coloring agents. Domag daughter suffered from the chronic wound infection. And she was one of the first patients that was treated with prontosil, and it was extremely effective. She was cured. Okay, so it was the first synthetic antibacterial drug, and they were awarded Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And then, of course, 1924, 28 different sources say differently. Um, Fleming, Alexander Fleming, Scottish scientist came back home after a weekend and looked at his bacterial plates with staphylococci, I think. And what he noticed is that in one plate was a colony of fungus. I, I picture it green. And around that colony was clear zone of inhibition for the staphylococci. Does that make sense? Like the ones that you saw around the antibiotic infused discs. Was he first who saw that? Probably not. But he was the first who made a conclusion. He was the, it's, it's a great example of serendipity in science, the accident. It was complete accident. But he made a conclusion that, that um, fungus, penicillin and the tatum, produces some chemical that kills bacteria. It took several years um, to isolate penicillin and do the chemical, uh, do the um, clinical studies, penicillin in mice and people against gram positive infections. It was done by Flory and Chain. So altogether, Fleming, Flory and Chain received Nobel Prize 1945. And you can imagine how important it was with the soon onset of World War II. Penicillin was used to treat wound infections at that time. Finally, Dorothy Hodgkin in 1946 determined the structure of penicillin, the chemical structure, why it was so important. Scientists, chemists started to modify the molecule. Okay? Tweaking its specificity, um, trying to avoid bacterial resistance, so on and so forth. Okay. Another great pioneer in discovering antibiotics was Zelman Waxman, who is, it was his institute, his huge lab. They were looking for antibiotics in different bacteria and um, fungi, and they discovered aminoglycosides like actinomycin and neomycin, right, streptomycin. Um, so they pretty much were the first antibiotics that showed the effectiveness not only against gram positives like staph and strep, but also against gram negatives like E. coli, francisel, and other 
pretty nasty infections. Now, you may see, you, you, you notice that it ends in 50s. Did we not make any huge strides since then? Yes, we did. But the problem is that each discovery of new antibiotic is pretty soon followed by what? Antibiotic resistance that the microbes develop. So it's an arms race. We're going to discuss it um, tomorrow. Okay. For now, I'm going to wrap it up.